Hello everyone, I'm Christopher Linfont, and welcome to Nest Talk, the most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the entire internet. Today is a bit short, uh, I mean late, you know, a day late, dollar short on these episodes, or I am two days late on this, but due to the holiday season kind of wrapping up, some other things that came up, I uh, wasn't able to get this out on Wednesday or Thursday, but it is Friday, we're still before the Ravens game this Sunday, uh, so technically still on time, uh, but I am late on this, so I do apologize to our listeners out there who have been waiting for a couple days for this episode to come out. But it is here today on Friday. It's about 1.50 at the time of recording this. Wanted to wait a little bit uh, just so I could get some more information on some you know, injury news and everything. Um, and I do want to start out with that really really quickly because it is such an easy one today. Uh, only one Ravens player is out on, on the injury. Um, not the injured reserve. He did not practice in, in uh, well, he did not participate in practice today. Uh, that would be wide receiver Chris Moore. Um, the Ravens expect him to be back for Sunday. He practiced the previous two days. He's dealing with a muscle issue. Uh, got injured on Sunday's game against the Cleveland Browns. Um, the Ravens also were missing Tavon Young for the past few days, but he is back in practice um, after dealing with an injury. So the Ravens should be healthy to go against the Los Angeles Chargers. But I do want to cut back to that uh, Cleveland Browns game in Baltimore. I was there. It was a very raucous crowd. Uh, a very, very, very good game by the Ravens. Uh, they, they closed out the year. They win the division, and it is, it's ecstatic, really. Uh, they haven't won the division since 2012, haven't made the playoffs since 2014. Now they they win the division. They're back in the playoffs uh, here in 20, well, tw- now 2019, uh, but that was in 2018. Uh, a remarkable finish, I thought. The game was very well played, I thought, by the Ravens. Uh, it was a little bit difficult for them to control the Browns' offense, uh, especially in specific uh, personnel packages, I've noticed. Um, but overall, I think the Ravens did a pretty good job um, really adapting to what the Browns do with them. So, for instance, uh, the Browns really like to run a, a one tight end package with no running backs in there, and they were getting consistent yards with the air. Baker Mayfield threw for about 181 yards. 181 yards on those uh, personnel packages, and the Ravens weren't having the answers for it until the very last play uh, of that of that Browns drive that was threatening um, to score on the Ravens, and then put this game into you know um, into the Browns win column and the Ravens loss column, knocking them out of the playoffs. Um, the Ravens answered it though; that they knew what was coming for them. They went with the zero uh, cover zero blitz, and I thought that was a great call by Marty. I'm not sorry, not Marty Mordenweg. Um, Don Martindale, great call on the defensive side of the ball. You want to put pressure on Mayfield, especially as a young passer. Um, and he just wasn't able to come up with a, with a with a good play there. They they stopped him three plays in a row with the same cover defense, the cover zero blitz. Uh, and that, for those who don't know out there, is a blitz where all your players who aren't covering a specific man are blitzing. So there's no safety help. Those guys are going to typically either blitz or cover a specific player. Uh, so, you know, either your linebackers or your safeties are blitzing. You know, there's a, it's just a bigger blitz with no zone at all, and it's all one-on-one man coverage uh, throughout. But it was very, it was a big gamble because that play can oftentimes allow for big uh, gains through the air, you know, with no safety help, no zone in there to kind of, you know, balance out that that man attack. Uh, it, it, it would be... You know, not easy, but it's very possible and almost probable that they could find something. But the hope is the blitz will get to them and put them off balance or sack the quarterback, preventing that. Just that's just what happened. Uh, Baker Mayfield had very little time to throw on the three plays leading up to it, and then the play, uh, the final play on the fourth and ten, uh, he drops back to throw, and he uh, he ends up getting picked off by C.J. Mosley. So that was a very good play, I thought. And the Ravens, I thought, did a very good job. Forcing turnovers, of course, C.J. Mosley's interception at the end. But Jimmy Smith had two interceptions. One actually was uh, batted up by C.J. Mosley. Um, Jimmy Smith probably could have gotten it anyway, but it definitely altered it and slowed it down to make an easier catch. Um, but Jimmy Smith did have had a very good game. Had no interceptions on the year going into the game. Uh, he came out with two. The Ravens defense, I thought, did a phenomenal job. They held the run game to a very minimal amount. Uh, you, you saw you know, Nick Chubb with only, I think, 24 yards. They barely rushed at all this game. Overall, I thought the Ravens did a fine job in that department. Um, you know, looking at the receivers, obviously Jarvis Landry, I thought was going to be a big problem. I also said that Rashad Perryman would be a problem, and he was. He had 43, 45 yards on three attempts. Uh, David Njoku got going late in the game with 62 yards on three catches. Antonio Callaway, all game, 79 yards with four, att- with four rushes. I'm sorry, four receptions. Rashad Higgins, uh, 86 for four as well. Um, this passing attack led by Baker Mayfield is off the charts. I think it's going to be very good next year. I do want to talk a little bit about that 
later on in this episode and where the Browns are going to stand next year and some of the head coaching searches going on in the AFC North. But to get back to this game, uh, moving on to the offensive side of the ball, I thought the Ravens did a very, very good job controlling the ball, controlling the time of possession, running the ball effectively, uh, and they did it really with specifically um, a 11 package on the field. That means, so, one running back, uh, one tight end lined up. You know, you can have other tight ends on the field, but if they line up as, you know, wide receiver, I'm not going to count them in 11 personnel here. Um, but they averaged in that personnel group, the one tight end, one running back, 8.56 yards per carry with 214 uh, total rushing yards on 25 attempts. I mean, they got touchdowns through this one. Um, Lamar Jackson ran ran tremendously well. Had a very good day on the ground. Um, Kenneth Dixon was very was fantastic as well. You know, 12 12 carries, 117 yards, no touchdowns though. Lamar Jackson two touchdowns on the ground, 90 yards on 20 carries, and of course Gus Edwards for 12 carries. He got 76 yards. Uh, the longest rush by each player here. I mean, this is what's really standing out. I mean, these are like passing yard numbers. Like these are really long. These are not super long passes, but these are like longer passes that you wouldn't expect a running back to get this kind of yardage on the ground. You got Kenneth Dixon with 37 yards on one play. That is phenomenal. That play right there, uh, 37 yards. I mean, it is just outrageous that the Ravens were able to do that. Um, you know, you never get that kind of production on, on a, on a play. Um, but the Ravens did, with um with 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 Kenneth uh, Dixon there, Gus Edwards also came in. He had a huge rush for 25. I'm sorry, 24 yards. Lamar Jackson had a 24 and a 25 yard rush. Uh, I think both of them were touchdowns. If I remember correctly, but overall, a fantastic day um by the Ravens rushing attack. And I think Lamar Jackson did fair enough in the passing attack as well. He found Mark Andrews four times for 20 54 yards. Willie Sneed didn't really get going in this game again. Second straight week, he's kind of been absent. He didn't catch any balls against the Chargers. But here he uh, goes with 25 yards on one one, one pass play. Um, Hayden Hurst also got two passes for 43 yards. Michael Crabtree, two for 20. Chris Moore, 219. Uh, Ty Montgomery, one for nine. John Brown, one for seven. And Kenneth Dixon, one for two. I think Lamar Jackson improved in his accuracy overall. His precision's getting better. His decision-making is getting better. He's improving at a much faster rate than I thought he actually would. I wasn't super sure that he would actually be able to pass the ball with any effectiveness going into the NFL, but he's already showing that he can. The question is how, how much of it can he sustain? How much of it can he be consistent on? Because he did pass 14 for 24. I mean, that's not super great, but when you rush for 219, 296 yards total, I don't know you know how you can complain a whole lot for the Ravens there on offense. I mean, it was a phenomenal game, I thought, personally. Uh, maybe just, I'm biased because I was there, and it was a, a fantastic game. The crowd was really into it. And it was really crazy to be there when the division when they won the division. The whole crowd erupted, just walking out of the stadium. There was chants. I mean, everybody was chanting. Uh, the Baltimore Sun had already printed the Ravens win the division uh, or AFC North champs. I forget what the headline is, but they were giving them out. I didn't get when they ran out, but um, but it was it was really. It, it, I couldn't even get out of Baltimore. Not to you know sidetrack here, but I mean, getting out of that area with the stadium, it took forever because there were so many so many people there. I think the stadium. I didn't see a single empty seat in that stadium, I don't think. Um, maybe the very, very top. But, I mean, looking down from where I was, I mean, I didn't see... I was up in the top. There was, like, nobody. Um, no empty seats. We saw... Um, basically, everybody was filling the seats on the bottom rows. There were a few in the top that were kind of empty. Um, but, you know, you're not going to fill every seat, you know, at every point in time. Um, but it was a very good game. The stadium was packed. Uh, and I really think the Ravens flock helped out with that noise in there. But, you know, the game, um, highlight of the game, obviously C.J. Mosley's interception to win it. Um, and that'll be a strong contender for when we do our um, season um, awards for the best play of the game. That'll be best play of the year, I should say. Um, that'll definitely be up there on the list. Uh, but moving on now, I do want to talk a little bit about the playoff seating and schedule. So, obviously, the Ravens win the AFC North. Um Ten, they finished the year ten and six. That's what they won the AFC North last time. Um, that record, that's what they used. That was the, bah, that's what they had. Um, but um, they're coming in now. They're gonna have a home playoff game, but that'll probably be, be the last game um, at home, unless some crazy, you know, sixth or fifth seed run. You know, it will have to be the sixth one because the fifth seed is the Chargers, and they're gonna play them. If the sixth seed Colts ran the table to the AFC Championship game, the Ravens could conceivably have a home playoff game again, but that's very unlikely. Um, so the Ravens will basically have one, it'll be a one-and-done home playoff game here. But 
Um, they do face the Chargers. They beat the Chargers a couple weeks ago. Um, exactly two weeks ago, actually. Um, this Saturday would be the exact two weekday. Uh, they'll play them um, at 105 this Sunday, January 16th, in Baltimore. Um, CBS has the coverage again. CBS had the coverage last week, had the coverage in week 14 with the Chargers, and week 13 with the, um, Can- not Kansas City Chiefs, not Chargers. I-, I said I said this all wrong. They had it last week with the Browns, uh, week 14 with the Chiefs, and week 13 with the, the Atlanta Falcons. Of course, CBS has a lot of Ravens games, but I'm specifically talking about Jim Nance and Tony Romo here. They're the two main men for CBS. They'll be out front for this Ravens game. The other matchups in the AFC um, this week, well, there's really one other matchup in the AFC, and that's tomorrow at, I think, 4.05 or 4.25, somewhere around there. The Colts and Texans are going to show off, uh, show down. That's a division uh, matchup for those two teams. Uh, the Colts are really hot right now coming into this game. The Texans did win against the Jaguars, but they lost against the Eagles a couple weeks ago. Um, I can see that game going either way. And then in the other seedings, you have the Chiefs at the number one seed at 12-4, and, and the Patriots at 11-5, the second seed. So I think this conference is really open here. If you look at, I mean, the, the, the Ravens competed with the Chiefs uh, a few weeks ago in week 14, I think it was, and they were right down to the wire. I mean, if the Ravens had won there, the Ravens could potentially have been a second seed here. Um, but the Chiefs, you know, they're not that super good. They're good, but they're not, you know, they're not out of Baltimore's reach is what I'm trying to say. So I don't think anybody in this AFC is out of Baltimore's reach at this point. Um, the NFC, though, I think the Saints will probably run away with that. They're in the you know first seed. The Rams have a shot at it, but I don't think they'll be able to get past the Saints. They're in the two seed. Uh, the two wild card round games for the NFC will be the Seahawks and Cowboys, the four and five seed squaring off in AT&T Stadium, Jerry's World in um, Dallas. Uh, and, of course, you have the Eagles who snuck into the playoffs through the back door there uh, because the Bears did them a favor and beat the Vikings. Uh, but now they're gonna have the Eagles will have to face the Bears, the guys who got them in the playoffs, uh, and try to beat them at Soldier Field in Chicago. Um, it's tough for me to make the, the predictions on this side. I think the Seahawks have a good shot at being the Cowboys, um, but I'm not sure they will. I think they probably uh, can do it, though, and I think the Bears will probably probably beat the Eagles, although my heart is telling me the Eagles, but my brain is telling me the Bears, so we'll have to see how that goes. Okay, um, going into the playoffs now, Lamar Jackson will be the youngest quarterback to ever start a playoff game. Uh, he's 21. His 22nd birthday is this upcoming Monday. Um, so he'll be the youngest player ever starting to start a quarterback in the, in the playoffs. Um, and what's just interesting about that is he also won AFC Offensive Rookie of the Month for December, um, and he shares that with uh, the Defensive Rookie of the Month, Tremaine Edmonds of the Buffalo Bills, the linebacker. Um, I think that, you know, Lamar Jackson has a chance to win this game. He already beat the Chargers once before, he and the Ravens, I should say. Um, So if the Ravens can win this game, uh, he'll continue on to have a shot at being, I think, the youngest quarterback to win a Super Bowl. Um, I know Ben Roethlisberger is currently the youngest quarterback to win a Super Bowl, but I don't know uh, what year? I don't think it would really matter though if if Lamar Jackson's the number one, the the youngest quarterback to start in a playoff game, uh, you know even younger than Ben Roethlisberger was when he won the Super Bowl. I don't think that that could possibly um, be any older than Ben Roethlisberger when he plays the Steelers, unless you know they were born basically around the same time and the the, the Super Bowl is like a few days later than normal or whatever. Um, but you know he has a chance to do something really special here with this Ravens offense going into the playoffs, and I think he can. We'll just have to see how it plays out. Um, but I think he did deserve this AFC Offensive Rookie of the Month um, award for December. Look, I doubted him so far. I'm still not 100% convinced that he's going to be a very good quarterback, but right now what he provides to this offense, what he's doing on the ground alone, I think warrants him uh, the Offensive Player of the Month uh, as a rookie. So we'll have to see where the playoffs go, uh, how far the Ravens can get into it. I don't think they're out of it just because they have a rookie quarterback. I don't think they're out of it because the Chiefs are in this this conference. I think they're in it. I think they're probably one of the more dangerous teams. They're the hottest team, I think, going into the playoffs right now. But they're very dangerous with this stout defense and this really potent offensive rushing attack. And, you know, the sky's the limit here, and we'll have to see what they can do in the playoffs. Uh, you can catch my full predictions for the Chargers game um, on BaltimoreFeather.com. I think I'll put them out on Saturday this time, which is tomorrow instead of Sunday, and maybe try to get... Um, the post-game coverage in on Sunday instead, just to bump everything up a day. Um, that might just be better. But if I don't do that, then it'll be on Sunday. So you can find that there. And, of course, we'll go through the three key matchups of the Chargers and Ravens game uh, for the wild card round later in this episode. 
But first, I want to talk a little bit about news that broke today. Uh, the AP All Pro list came out today. Of course, the Associated Press. They gather 50 media members from across the nation, and they they come in and figure out this 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 high honor for NFL players to be on this list. You can be a first or second teamer, and I think they pick one per per uh, position, if I remember correctly. Uh, you know for first and second team, and there are three Ravens players on the AP All Pro list, regardless of your first or second team, obviously being first team is better, but being on the second team alone is a high honor in the NFL, uh, but Justin Tucker, he made the first team All Pro list as a kicker, Marshall Yonda, second team All Pro list as a guard, and of course, CJ Mosley, second team All Pro, inside linebacker, I mean, these are just great guys, uh, you know, I think Yonda made the, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure Yonda made the Pro Bowl this year, and I know Mosley made the Pro Bowl. Um, but Justin Tucker, uh, he got snubbed from the Pro Bowl this year. Um, not really sure how, why. He had, a, I think, in my opinion, a fantastic year. Um, but, you know, he didn't make the Pro Bowl this year, and I was a little bit disappointed about that. Yes, Marshall Yonda, I just checked, did make the Pro Bowl this year, so did C.J. Mosley. Um, so two Pro Bowlers on this list, but I think, you know, the, the All-Pro honor is probably a little bit better than the Pro Bowl because the Pro Bowl you're being voted by, you know, it's more, I wouldn't call it a popularity contest, but, you know, the fans have the one-third, players have a one-third, and coaches have a one-third. I mean, it's a bit of a popularity contest. When you get the media members together, I think they're a little bit more analytical on who they're going to pick, and they picked him to be a first-team All-Pro kicker. I think that's, you know, well enough for him. Uh, but Justin Tucker is an alternate for the... Um, for the Pro Bowl, and who knows, if they make the Super Bowl, it won't even matter, because he wouldn't play in the Pro Bowl anyway at that point, um, so yeah, he could make, he still could make the Pro Bowl, depending on who goes to the Super Bowl, or if the, if the kicker, uh, decides not to go, so, um, look, we'll have to see how it goes, but I think that this is a high honor for all three of these guys, and it's a very, very good sign for the Ravens to come, He's, Justin Tucker's gonna be around here for a while, and CJ Mosley, as long as they pay the man, he'll be here, I think it would be very stupid to let him walk, I think they gotta get a deal before he even hits free agency. That's my opinion on this. Marshall Yonda obviously doesn't have a whole lot of time left. He is in his 12th year right now, but I can see him still being around for another four or five years, probably. Um, but moving on, um, you know, another team that doesn't have such a bright future ahead, I think, is the Pittsburgh Steelers. I wrote an article, uh, I think it was like a thousand words, on, you know, the Steelers' decline and how it's been unfolding recently. And what we're seeing is a complete, I think, an implosion of a team that at one point was considered among the elite contenders in the AFC and the NFL as a whole. The Steelers, so not so much anymore, um, really have a long way to go at this point. They didn't make the playoffs this year. I don't think they'll make the playoffs next year. Uh, and if the, the trend continues, they might be out of the playoffs for a few more years after that. Um, so what am I talking about? Well, uh, Le'Veon Bell, we already know the situation with him. He's already out. He denied that franchise tag. He wanted that long-term deal. Nothing short of $14.5 million a year. A year Didn't get it from the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, and he wants to get it elsewhere now. So he's out. Um, Antonio Brown now got into an argument with Ben Roethlisberger, was benched for it in the Bengals game. Really strange decision uh, by Mike Tomlin. You know, he tolerates a lot of these antics that Antonio Brown goes through. But, you know, when he gets into a fight with Ben Roethlisberger before the biggest play, before the biggest game of the year, you bench him, but you don't bench him for some of the other things he does. You don't punish him for some of the, I don't understand that. You got to be consistent, I think. But Antonio Brown, now he might be looking for a trade. He's like some, on, on Instagram, he liked the 49ers um, post. I don't think it was the 49ers account, but someone made a 49ers jersey with his name on it. He liked that. Uh, 49ers wide receiver George Kittle reached out to him on Twitter. And, you know, Antonio Brown responded with the, you know, the glowing eyes emoji. Um, he reportedly asked for a trade. Um, and I say reportedly in quotes here because I think the original report came out by Jason La Conforna. Uh, but he's had a lot of misses. He's missed the mark quite a few times on reports. And I, I can't really trust him in full. Ian Rappaport of the NFL Network uh, said that he didn't officially request a trade. But, you know, it seems like Antonio Brown is, is really feeling the need for a trade here. I don't know the whole situation with the Steelers. I know it won't hurt it would hurt their cap situation, I believe, if they were to trade Antonio Brown. Um, but obviously he's not happy there. He's becoming a bit of a diva. Uh, well, he's becoming a bit of a diva. He is a diva at this point. Um, and it's not looking good for him long term prospects here. Uh, ben Roethlisberger is inching towards retirement. He did commit to playing in 2019, but, you know, at some point he's going to have to go. Uh, he can't stick around forever. He is getting injured quite a lot. Um, it seems like every year Ben Roethlisberger goes through another injury. Um, 
So we'll have to see how long he can hold up in the NFL. But, um, you know, I don't know how much longer he has. But I don't think if, you know, he'll be around for at least, he'll, I mean, he could be around for another year or two, but I don't think he'll be around for three more years um, is what I'm saying here. And if that's the case, then the Steelers are really looking on, on from the outside in in a few years. I know Mason Rudolph has potential, but when you got the offense, like it, like it looks like it's going to happen. Of course, you got Juju Smith-Schuster and James Conner there. Maybe, they, they could be the next big tri- trio, and, and Juju Smith-Schuster, James Conner, and Mason Rudolph. But I really don't buy it yet, and I think the Steelers are definitely on the decline. Obviously, this defense isn't very good. They had a bit of anomaly year. Uh, and Mike Tomlin just doesn't seem to be able to control this team at this point. Not a very good situation for the Steelers long term. Now let's move on to the Browns. Kind of taking a little bit of a tour of the AFC North here. Uh, the Browns, I think next year they're going to be a competitor for the AFC North crown. Uh, as long as they make the right hire at head coach. And we're going to talk about that next. We're not really going to talk about the Bengals here. Because I think it's quite obvious what's going on with the Bengals are on the decline. They've, they've been on the decline for a few years. I think it could be a basement dweller next year. But... Uh, to the Browns here, they've got Baker Mayfield coming back for year two, the ecstatic running back Nick Chubb coming back for year two, they got Jarvis Landry coming back, I think they'll bring back Brashad Perryman, I don't know his full contract details, uh, David Njoku entering year three now, um, they've got a lot of great players on offense, and they're building up that defense with Miles Garrett, they've got Jamie Collins there already, they got a few more p- people on defense, uh, and that defense will become elite, this offense is already elite, and this is going to be one of the contenders for the AFC North crown, and I think they'll probably make the playoffs next year, so I think the Browns are in a very good situation moving forward with some of these great guys, and not to shoot my own horn here, but I did say before the draft that Baker Mayfield was the best quarterback in the draft, a lot of people were saying it was Sam Darnold, uh, others were saying it was, you know, Lamar Jackson or Sam Rosen out there, and I, I stuck my foot in the ground, I said Baker Mayfield is the best quarterback in this draft. Appears I was right, at least what we know in his rookie quarterback um, performance here. And we'll have to see how it plays out in year two. But he's got a lot of talent, and this offense has a lot of talent around it. And if you can build up that defense a little bit more, it's already a good defense, but you can make it a much better defense too. And you can make this offense even better moving forward. I think this Browns team will probably make the playoffs next year and put a threat to the Ravens, who I think will probably be everybody's favorite to win the division next year. Um, They'll put a threat to them, if not beat them in in the division battle. Um, but moving on to the head coaching situation in the AFC North, I want to talk a little bit about this because there are two open positions in the AFC North, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Cleveland Browns. First, starting with the Cleveland Browns, uh, they have two guys from in-house who they may hire. I think they're going to lean towards Greg Williams here. Greg Williams, obviously, the defensive coordinator promoted to interim head coach when Hugh Jackson was fired. Um, you know, he did a phenomenal job with the Browns down the stretch. They were really rallying behind him and the offensive and the offensive staff who is also um, one of their guys is going to be interviewing, who already did interview for this head coach job. But Greg Williams, I think, deserves this job. You know, he won them a lot of games as interim head coach. They had the best year in a very long time, and the Browns are real competitors for the playoffs down really the last couple weeks. So I think they will actually go with Greg Williams. That's what my gut tells me, and I think that the Browns have had way too much time, uh, you know, playing this coaching carousel to, to look at these results and say, we can still find somebody better out there. Um but they could they could get Freddie Kitchens, their offensive coordinator, who is interviewing for the job. Um, of course, he's got the repertoire with um, Baker Mayfield, the new Browns franchise quarterback. Um, so that could be a possibility. I know Jim Caldwell. I think he already interviewed with the Browns. Um, you know, former Ravens offensive coordinator for Lions head coach. I think he had, was the head coach of the the um, the Colts. I believe if I'm remember, remembering correctly for a short period of time. He's had success in the NFL, um, but I don't think he'll have, you know, a whole... He hasn't had a, you know, a hugely great career as a coach. He's had some good stints, uh, but nothing that crazy. They've also um, interviewed Kevin Stefanski, the Vikings offensive coordinator, took over when John DeFilippo was fired. He was the big name going into the, the head coaching search. Um, if you ask everybody last year, even mid-year, John DeFilippo was going to be a big name, uh, and he's nowhere to be found right now. He got fired as offensive coordinator. They couldn't get a whole lot rolling in Minnesota with him. Um, and they also are going to interview Mike McCarthy, the Browns are. Former Giants, I'm sorry, not Giants, Packers head coach. Mike McCarthy, obviously one of the better coaches in the league. His his um, his his message ran stale in, in, in Green Bay a little bit, but he is one of the better coaches in the league. A great offensive mind. Won a Super Bowl um, with the Packers. So, I mean, he's probably going to be the most sought-after coach um, this coaching carousel cycle here. 
Um, I Again, I think that Greg Williams should get it, and I think he will get it. Um, I think that McCarthy might be a strong candidate too, and so will Freddie Kitchens be. Uh, I don't think Jim Caldwell will be much of a candidate here. Um, Stefanski, maybe, uh, but I highly, highly doubt that. You know, just coming in as an offensive coordinator for a few weeks and, and you know, going to get a head coach job out of that, I really don't think that's a good idea. Um, but moving on to the Bengals here, this one's a bit of a mess, I, I think. There's not a whole lot of great coaches that I see on this list. Uh, reportedly interested in Bill Lazar, the Bengals' offensive coordinator. They're also interested in another in-house hire, Darren Simmons, their special teams head coach. I'm sorry, special teams coach. Uh, former former defensive coordinator with the Bengals. Um, former head coach at the Broncos was just fired. Vance Joseph, they want to bring in an interview. I don't know if they interviewed him yet or not. Um they're also thinking about Zach Taylor, the Rams quarterback coach. I'm not sure why you would hire a positional coach to be your head coach. Uh, usually you want a coordinator or, you know, whether it's offense, defense, or special teams. But I don't know about a quarterback's coach coming in here and doing a lot. Um, you know, I just don't see that happening with the, the Bengals, especially because, you know, they have Andy Dalton, who's already a veteran quarterback. It's not like they're trying to develop a guy. Um, but they're also looking at the Rams pass game coordinator, Shane Waldron, another you know, kind of a head-scratching choice there. I'm not really sure why they would want a pass game coordinator head coach. Uh, maybe he's got a pass. I don't know. Specifically with, with, with Shane Walden, uh, Waldron, I would go for more of an Eric Bieniemy, who they are looking at with, for the Chiefs offensive coordinator. Uh, the Andy Reid coaching tree is filled with guys who keep competing. You already got two Super Bowl winners out of that tree with Doug Peterson and... Uh, John Harbaugh, you may be able to find another one of those kind of guys there. Uh, Matt Nagy is also out of that tree. So um, I think that's an untapped you know, potential right there. And Eric Bieniemy, that's who I would probably look at. Uh, and they're also looking at the Buccaneers offensive coordinator. This actually just came out before I started recording. Uh, Todd Monken, um, not really sure why he, the offense at the – well, I mean, the offense at the Buccaneers is good, right? But I'm, I'm not really sure if that's a great, great hire. Um, I would personally – I would go with – Greg Bieniemy, I would stay as far. I'm sorry, Eric Bieniemy, not Greg. Uh, you know, Greg Williams is the head coach of the Browns. I think who's he, he um, the interim head coach. I think he'll be the head coach next year. Eric Bieniemy, I think should be the Bengals hire. You know, based on these guys right now, maybe they'll go after Mike McCarthy. Um, I don't think Vance Joseph would be a good hire. I think we've already seen what he can't do, uh, and I think Hugh Jackson would be a terrible hire. Uh, Hugh Jackson proved that he cannot head coach a team, the dysfunctionality with the Browns enough, regardless of the win column, the dysfunctional situation with Cleveland is just a mess. So no thank you for Hugh Jackson. If the Bengals want to lose, Hugh Jackson, if they want to win, I would go with Eric Bieniemy. Um, so that wraps up the AFC North kind of, you know, rotation here, going around and looking at these head coach openings and seeing, you know, where where potential guys can land. Um, I think the, the, Bengals, the Browns head coaching job is probably the most coveted right now because of the talent they've got on that roster moving forward. Um, and the decline of the Steelers, the decline of the Bengals are already in the basement. Uh, if they make a bad hire head coach, I think that the Bengals will be even more in the basement. And if the, the Browns make the bad hire head coach, that could put them back in the basement. So it's not guaranteed that they're going to compete right away here. They have to get a good head coach. And I think Greg Williams is probably their man at this point. Um, so moving on to the Chargers matchup, our last segment on today's episode, uh, Three key matchups against the Chargers. We saw what they could do two weeks ago, and we saw that the Ravens were very prepared for it. And that actually, that win, without that win, they wouldn't be in the playoffs at this moment. So, fantastic job by the Ravens to get that win, um, you know, and, and, and really get themselves in the playoffs. Basically, in a win-or-go-home situation, they didn't realize that would be a win-or-go-home win or situation. Um, so, three key matchups after what we've seen with the Chargers the first time around. I think Lamar Jackson versus the front seven. I think the Chargers could be very more, much more aggressive this time around in pursuing Lamar Jackson um, and trying to get rid of him, uh, prevent him from doing a whole lot on the ground. Uh, if Lamar Jackson can beat this front seven, if the, the Ravens' front front line really can hold back this front seven from getting to Lamar Jackson or Lamar Jackson can make these guys miss on the ground, I think they're going to have a fantastic day on the ground because, you know, if you have Lamar Jackson being productive, they got to watch your hand. that will open up. Um, Gus Edwards, Kenneth Dixon as well. So right there, off the bat, that's the biggest matchup. Another matchup is going to be Phillip Rivers versus the Ravens secondary. The Ravens secondary gave Phillip Rivers nightmares last time around. Um, it was very difficult for him to move the ball at all. So uh, moving on into the game two, 
with these guys. I think Phillip Rivers will try to attack the secondary a bit more, be a little bit more aggressive. But the Ravens secondary can pull pull off what they did in the first game. They should have no problem at all beating them this time around. Uh, and finally, the Ravens special teams versus the Chargers special teams. Ravens special teams wasn't super great against the Chargers. Missed two field goals. Uh, I think there was something wrong with the, the, the ground because Justin Tucker slipped on the first one. And then the second one, of course, was a 65-yard attempt. You know, they just want to see if he could make it at that point. Couldn't do that. So I think if the Ravens special teams outplays the Chargers special teams, uh, that'll boost the chance, the likelihood of winning the game. Um, okay, so yeah, that'll be it for today's episode of Nest Talk. Nest Talk episode 24, recorded on Friday, uh, January 4th. Um, you can follow Nest Talk at Nest Talk on Twitter or find us on Facebook. Just search up Nest Talk. And on every time there's a new episode, we will post it there. So that's always a good thing for you to do. Uh, make sure to download us on iTunes and rate us there. That always helps. You can find Baltimore Feather at Be More Feather on Twitter or search it up on Facebook. You can find me at Chris Linfont on Twitter. And of course, you can always visit the Baltimore Feather at BaltimoreFeather.com for the latest and greatest articles, news, and opinions about the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, so I'm Chris Linfont signing out. Have a great new year, everybody. I know it's a little bit late, but have a great new year, and we'll see you after the Ravens playoff game against the Chargers back to our regular schedule on Wednesday of next week. Take care, everybody.